Hey, it's Cardinal. Just a quick content warning that at the half hour mark, there's a brief mention of a friend's death by self-harm. Nothing graphic, just letting you know. All right, on with the episode. This idea that sex comes natural, it's just not a thing. And the beauty of what you were just talking about of learning each other's bodies and communicating through all this and knowing that things change. Welcome back to Queer Relationships, Queer Joy. We are excited to have an interview and get to spotlight another queer couple today. But before we do that, we will do our introductions. I'm one of your hosts, Melissa DeSeguron. And I am your other host, Keely C. Helmick. <laughs> we are excited to have an interview today. We will let you both inter or introduce yourselves. To start off, I'm Melissa DeSeguron. I'm licensed as a marriage and family therapist and professional counselor. I'm white, I'm bisexual, able-bodied, I'm polyamorous, and I am gender fluid. I use she and they pronouns. And my name is Keely C. Helmick. I am a licensed professional counselor, a certified sex therapist. I am the owner of Connective Therapy Collective as well. I am a white, queer, non-binary person, solo, single. And, you know, this my back just keeps getting better and better, which is awesome. So I'm very happy. And would the two of you like to in introduce yourselves to the audience? Sure. I'm Tara Shapiro. She, her, cis female, white. Um, yeah, we're in New York City and have a lot of fun. And I'm Maddie Douse. I'm a speech language pathologist. I work in a public school system and I am a cis female, white as well. And very I madly in love with my wife here. <laughs> I am also founder, a uh, co-founder at the Alana Faye Chen Foundation, which is a 501c3 that offers free to low-cost mental health care to the queer community. And then I am CEO and co-founder of Queer Psych. And we are also also um, both a neurodivergent. We are proud members of the community as well. Awesome. I'm so excited. It's been a while since we've gotten to interview a couple and I already feel the energy. <laughs> I just, like We talk about queer joy at the end and we'll get there. But part of my queer joy and holding space for these stories is just like feeling the love between you resonating through the screen. So thank you for being here. <laughs> for inviting us. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, that's a big thing. And we might not have said it in a while, but really one of the big reasons we started this podcast is to have a place to share stories and talk about what's going well in queer relationships so often in media and the stories we hear is drama and we hear about breakups and there's not a lot of modeling for joy and positivity within the queer community in relationships and so we really want to share these stories and to have this collection of positive queer experiences and being in relationship with others awesome tara and i like joke sometimes like we'll be out like it's like doing something like taking a walk and we'll just be like do you think other people love each other as much as we do <laughs> or like do you think that like that other people it's really like even with the age gap between us like there's our a 17 year age gap so i'm 43 and I just turned 26, but like, it's just been crazy that like beyond all of that, we just like met each other in the most perfect time in both of our lives for a relationship. And it's been like the most incredible, like healthy, like just three, almost three years of thriving at this point, which is amazing. I have something I never thought would be really possible. But sometimes, it, yes, yes to all that. Sometimes it's messy. <laughs> we appreciate that. We want the real, like what's working and how you've gotten there. Understanding relationships take work. They're hard. But let's start at the beginning. How how did you meet? How did you come into one another's lives? So 
we met on Tinder and it was like a running joke that like we didn't tell our family that at first we were like oh we ran into each other at the dispensary in town and then I was like just totally screwing with my family and I was like told my grandmother we met on like farmers only and she <laughs> did not bat an eye she was like oh yeah Tara loves gardening and I was like <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I actually we ever corrected that story for them but it was she was in town why were you in town so I lived in Florida at the time during COVID and I really disliked it it never felt like a cultural fit and so during COVID I had traveled a lot before I used to travel like a few times a month and so that had gone away and I decided to do a van life for a while and I was driving from Florida to the countryside in the mountains, very quiet. I think there's like 5,000 people in our town. And I would drive back and forth. And when I'd get there, I'd be able to like catch my breath because it was just so beautiful. COVID went away because there was so much space, nature, and just getting to know myself. So we were in the Berks, Berks Massachusetts. Um, you like, were there. Like, meanwhile, she like comes here to take a deep breath. And like, I was born and raised here. So I was like... <laughs> This is the most boring place in the universe. Like <laughs> anyone, like I can't I, look at some excitement. Yes. So I was like, oh my gosh, so this girl keeps like texting me back. And like, she always says that one of her favorite things was that I replied immediately when she would text me. I thought I was playing it so cool, <laughs> trying not to respond immediately. Like I remember <laughs> getting the text. All right, I'm going to wait 20 minutes. Like, don't be weird about it. Nope. And I was like, couldn't even do that. So when we first like met that first time, I was like, oh my God. Like I tried to kiss her and she was like, you need to slow down, lady. Like <laughs> this has never happened to like, wh what? Like, I was just like, oh, what do you want to do then? Like we uh, talk and we yeah, how do we slow down? What does that look like? It was kind of like, I don't, I didn't know how to like formally like engage in like that, kind of like a queer relationship beyond like this, the sexual part of it. Like there's not really any kind of archetype for queer dating in that kind of way. Especially in the mountains in the middle of nowhere with a small town, I think it still is yeah. hard for us to walk around sometimes, just holding mm -hmm. hands even. It's just different. We're just different. I was always different. Um, but yeah. yeah, I'd be like growing up in my town. I graduated from a school with a class of 50. Like we went from kindergarten to senior year together. We knew everyone, everybody. I was raised by my grandparents and they knew everyone. When my grandfather passed, they put like the flag in the town at like half mass. Like it was like everyone they, knows everyone. Yeah. So I don't even, I had never met another lesbian until I was nannying for a family and they, um, for like six years. And I got really close with their aunts who had a house in the Berkshires and were from the city. And I was like, these are the coolest people I've ever met. <laughs> like, oh my God. Like they have a pink house. It's full of crystals. Like it was the most amazing thing. And I think that was kind of Part of things, yeah, yeah, where I was like, this is possible? Like, this is a possibility? I think I want to check this out. So, yeah, she slowed me down a little bit. But I think from there, I literally ended up spending so much time with you and together. Like, I just abandoned everything at my house where I was living. Like, very much that, like, second day you all type situation. Yeah, I don't think we... Oh, I remember that you know, pushing back from that first kiss, but, and I felt really bad because I didn't want to hurt your feelings, but I, I wasn't couldn't. hurt. I think I liked it for sure. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you want to get to know me? Wow. Boundaries can be sexy. We say this all the time. And I think having a real example of that, of like, no, and even what you just said, Tara, about feeling bad. Like I hear that from clients all the time, feeling bad about setting a boundary, but like, thank you, Maddie, for demonstrating. That's okay. Sometimes. <laughs> It, that was something where I was like, oh, this person really like cares to get to know me and like well, values like the potential of this relationship more than having a good time that first night. I had been divorced. Is that how you say it? But I was divorced. You're still divorced. I'm still divorced. I yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And so after that, I was single for like three years. I just didn't click with anyone. And I didn't think I was ever going to be in a relationship again, not in a bad way, just like I was loving life. I was really independent, traveling, you know, spent like 20 years in therapy. So like, it was nice, like finding myself and like, like I said, driving back and forth. And our first date, I remember calling a friend and being like, I never want her to leave. Like, don't leave. And that was a first, like, it was just like the first day, like, I didn't want, and I kept calling my friends and I was like, oh my God, she's so much younger than me. But I, I like, I don't know, I really loved her, like, from the moment I laid eyes on her. Yeah. Same. I was um, not even out to my family at the time when we, like, kind of met and started getting together. And I think, like, by a week or two in, I was, like, had a PowerPoint presentation prepared for my grandmother and my aunt being, like, here are some information. Here's some information. I'm not in danger. There's like, you don't need to worry. Guess what? I'm queer. I'm here. Like, this, like this is what this does not mean. This is what this does mean. Yeah, even like a little terminology wise and kind of was just like, here, look at this and like backed away. And they were like, okay. And then I think we want them to were walk out. Were you not out before that? Oh, so this relationship was your coming out. Yes. To my family and that kind of like really 100% like being out. Like my close friends and things like that were about six or eight months before that. I had been dating around more so like hooking up with women in that kind of way. But this was more like, okay, this isn't a phase, everyone. Like this person is my future. And you went and prepared PowerPoint and everything. Yeah, I'm like very like science oriented. Like I love like research things. So I was just like, here it is. I'm going to like think of what questions they might have, answer them here. And like, that was that. Where did things go from there? How did you get to where you are now? A lot of work there. I have a history, I guess, could go into a little bit about that with neurodiversity, which really affects our relationship on a daily I was by diagnosed bipolar when I was like in college going to parties like and then I go to the psychiatrist saying that I'm like I have anxiety meanwhile I'm doing cocaine which I don't know if you should say here but you could take that out that's okay (laughs) that just matters if you want people to hear that or not but we're fine with that. So if what the reason why it is important to say is because I got diagnosed with bipolar disorder during a very interesting point in my life. And that diagnosis stayed with me until I met Maddie, who, you know, in the beginning, she would see me trying to get dressed. It was a big thing with the clothes feeling right. Always had to wear cotton or silk or linen or some natural fiber. Otherwise, it would get tossed out, of, you know, into a pile. Um, tags, just bright lights. It was so much worse. Um the experiences were really, really intense when we were first together. And I think part of it was because I didn't really have any support. Anybody that knew about diagnosed ASD, so autism spectrum disorder, it's apparently difficult to diagnose. I was missed when I was younger. Like many females, it is. And I came into the relationship. My father is diagnosed bipolar. And so it's my sister. So they are true to their diagnosis. So it was interesting, like meeting Tara and like learning that about her in my brain. I kind of was like, oh, like I had to really think about like what in what part of my brain kind of like led me to her. Like, is this something that I need to like kind of ping in my head of like putting myself in some of those same patterns? And that was so I kind of had that initial thought, but then seeing her, getting to know her, I was like, that is not what's happening here. And then like hearing things from her childhood and just seeing the way she would kind of react in those ways. Like as a speech language pathologist, we do part of uh, ASD diagnosis and things like that. And I have like a lot of experience working with every 
like newborns all the way up through adults who are on the spectrum. And it was more, it was a hard conversation to bring up to be like, hey, but I think it was needed because where we started, she was like sleeping in noise canceling headphones. We would have like all of these like sleeping accommodations and things like that. Like we would bring, I would get like little earplugs to go everywhere, but even just learning more about being neurodivergent and like what works and what doesn't work, I think has been a big game changer for both of us just in that we can do anything and everything. Like we just have to kind of plan a little bit more sometimes and like take those things into consideration and like, a lot of people have to think about like their energy level, like their battery. We have to kind of consider like that social battery and like how much masking is going to be involved and like how much that like, kind of can wear people out too. It's so cool to talk about this because I mean, Maddie completely changed my life. I was no longer the weirdo um, who wants to be alone. I was no longer... I mean, in the beginning, I think it was really hard for both of us because I can be very blunt and oftentimes that could be interpreted as rude or unkind, short, or I just don't. It's like from New York, I kind of thought it was at the beginning, but then I was like <laughs> traveling like elsewhere. But like we have the cute little rules of like sometimes we'll be like, are necessary is it necessary is it kind and is it true and that like, was <laughs> helpful and then i wore this bracelet forever that said kindness kindness is everything yeah kindness is everything and i should be like look at your bracelet yeah it. it really sounds like the context of the right diagnosis helped you release a lot of shame and then build together into the relationship just the accommodations i, I, I use that word that you needed to make everything work I think it also helped our families too, just like in me coming out and I feel like I know my family so much kind of better now. Like there's not, there's just like nothing in between kind of in that way. And your mom used to be like, oh, she makes me cry all the time. Cause like she would, she would say something and like, oh, you oh. were like, yeah, if you're dying in the hospital, I'm not going to want to go see you. I'm not going to come see you. And I was like, Actually, yes, we are. We will absolutely go visit you, Debbie. Like, we will be there to see. And, was, and my reasoning was I want to be on the beach and say goodbye to my mom in my heart without seeing her, yeah. like, deteriorate. So, and if that's what you truly want to do, we'll make it happen. But <laughs> we, you've got to at least be like, of course, Debbie, we, yeah. we will be there. But so, it's like, I understand what she means in those contexts. Like, I'm like, oh, that's not what you meant. That's what you said is not what you actually meant. Like you meant to say, like, I would like to be at a peaceful place. Yeah. But we'll do what you'd like. So really what I'm hearing is that the two of you were able to talk about these mental health struggles and differences in how you handle life and life circumstances, especially, oh my gosh, like handling the decline of a parent you know the health and i think you is your mom deceased now tara no we just had oh. a death in the family and you know woman my it's my step yeah. aunt, aunt my aunt she had alzheimer's oh. so it was slow decline and so i just yeah she was not doing well and we were driving in the car and i was like talking about my cousin who was at the beach um, because she didn't realize she didn't know her mom had passed away and she was making her way back home and everybody was upset that she was at the beach and I was like mom but it's just like so beautiful she probably sat by the beach and like connected with her mom in some way and said goodbye and that was my like meaning but it came out like I'm not going to be there I'm going to be on beach when you're suffering so but we cleared that up. We cleared. We had some support kind of translating what the message was. <laughs> I'm curious. I don't want to pivot too quickly, but you indicated that there, there may be some interesting, juicy things to talk about in your relationship. And I'm curious what intimacy looks like for you and what 
sex looks like if we can if we could talk about that it's been a journey for sure i myself and you have a history of like a physical abuse in that kind of way and a lot of trauma and like that's kind of like held in our bodies in that aspect and then for me especially this being my first like long term queer relationship i didn't even really know how things worked in that aspect like my idea was like okay what i've like either seen in porn or like movies and media i hadn't even seen the l word at that point like there was nothing to go like yeah <laughs> it was like yeah. newbie newbie so we started out kind of like doing what we thought was expected what like when we went to like one of the first it was early in our relationships i remember we were at the standard in new york city and you were like oh i'm gonna get the strap on and i was like okay like and it wasn't like we didn't really like talk about like what size or any like any of those kinds of details that now we know like a little more planning like we, there's certain things we like and don't like not one size fits all yeah that <laughs> Absolutely. So you didn't have the stars talks beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's been, I guess the juicy part is just the juicy part, right? Like being with each other, being naked, touching each other's bodies, learning what touch is because we call it like the sexy touch. Yes, yeah, sexy touch or touch, right? So there has been sexual abuse in both of our sides so it's been very learning different touch learning different feelings and what they're what's okay and what's safe mm -hmm. and if it wasn't safe in the past tear it's safe now like and kind of really staying mindful like which is a beautiful thing it's also when you're mindful I think about sex there's just so much that doesn't matter especially in a lesbian relationship. So when I say it doesn't matter, we were real I felt really pressured in getting the sex right every time so that we orgasmed within 20 minutes and we were both like out of breath and just frustrated. <laughs> and it, and it really like connecting our bodies to orgasm like it doesn't it require a specific angle. Like it's But not it's also hard. Like, oh yeah. We thought that it was about scissoring and we're like, oh my God, if we don't get this right, like, what are we doing? It doesn't work. Do we still love each other? Yeah. Like, and I'm like, how, are you gonna how have, like, am I a good, so like, future wife if I can't figure out, like, where to put things and, like, don't have the app? How many right? fingers to use? Like, that was a big thing. I think we came to the conclusion walking around in Miami and there was this, I don't remember, there was a saying on the floor it said on the sidewalk, it said, one finger is medical, two fingers is magical. <laughs> I love that. One finger is medical and two is magical. <laughs> In my and it kind of, yeah, yeah, I mean, it opened my eyes. It was like, like graffiti on the sidewalk. Like, <laughs> and I was like, okay, figuring this all out is like a human condition. Like, we're okay. Like, mm -hmm. We're going to stay proud of it, too. Or one yeah. finger. Um, and like recently, we took a little break from sex. And like, what is that like? Why is it? Are we going to fall apart? Because we're not just. Um, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't. And we had sex like two days ago. And we can't stop touching each other now. And I feel like I feel like it's the day after we met where I was like, I don't want you leaving. Don't leave. Yeah. I didn't say that to you. But I eventually said that. Yeah. So. It's okay. Like all of it's okay. Like to get nervous about positions or satisfying each other or just going through a spell where we kind of were both just had our own shit. Like some of my like PTSD kind of things were flaring up and like I had to kind of readjust what my plan was and prioritize kind of like meeting with my therapist and just like feeling safe for a little while. So it was I don't want to like open up that intimacy right now if I feel like I can't like fully be present and I don't want to like harm her in that way if I'm not kind of fully there. It was getting a little mechanical like and that was 
it was just getting mechanical. Mm-hmm. What um, a great and- use of that like tool though. And that is something that we recommend in sex therapy at times. Take it off the table or take orgasm off the table for that matter, you know, and all these expectations. And I hear that you were able to do those things without inserting all the problematic meaning making, or at least you were able to like notice when you were making meaning and then challenge it, which is so, so brilliant and so good for our listeners to hear. Well, and you're providing by talking about this and thank you for talking about something that's so vulnerable for many people that you're providing that modeling or just the opening for a conversation for others, because as we were just pointing out, where is the guidelines or how do you know what to do? And we so often in every realm of sex therapy and sex education are sex, this idea that sex comes natural, it's just not a thing. And the beauty of what you were just talking about of learning each other's bodies and communicating through all this and knowing that things change and accommodations. And I think from all that you've said so far, the two of you, as you've been talking is how much you've been supportive to each other and navigating all these different life things going on. And I'm curious now, the place you're at right now, if you were to say, what is working really well? What's working really well in your relationship? Slow. We've slowed down a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, yeah, it's just taking things slow and honoring each other. I think just being open to each other about what is difficult. Even I kind of had to have the realization of like, it's easier for me to tell Tara like what I'm struggling with or like what is really hard for me, even if it like with that shame and like guilt, because research has shown that like evidence is proven that like she helps me figure them out and like she's supportive through all of those things. So it's not like it's truly like a partnership where I can bring anything to the table, like even if I've screwed something up and like made a huge like whoops. To her, like, it's still just a little whoops, like. Yeah, we don't, we don't, like, we used to get mad for mistakes or whatever. And then we were, I was like, just say, oops. Yes. And, like, when things go wrong, it's like, shit, sorry. But our intentions are always, like, really loving. Sounds like you give each other a lot of grace. And we've talked about that recently, like, room to be human and understanding we're going to make mistakes and we're even going to perhaps unintentionally harm each other. And and how do we come back from that and recover from that? You know, sounds like you figured out how to do that. Yeah. It's, you know, interesting about the modeling thing, you know, for the last 25 years, and so I was about 16, didn't want to be, my parents were, aspects of them were amazing. Other aspects, um, like most parents weren't amazing. And I knew I needed mental health care from a very early age. And it was seen as a luxury then. So I worked really hard at making sure that and navigating my own mental health. And so with all of that work, it's so important to me to be as honest and raw as possible because my struggle should help or I hope could help somebody else that's, you know, hoping to get there one day or really anything. I feel like my life at this point is about service because I have a life beyond my wildest dream. That's so sweet. I'm not sure where to go from there. (laughs) Hey, hey, it's Cardinal. You're behind the scenes, buddy. QRQJ is hiring podcast editors. Do you know a rad person who loves love, sex, and audio transcription? BIPOC to the front. Work with Keely and Melissa and get paid to make this awesome community resource. It's seriously freaking great. (laughs) Uh, Compensation depends on experience and you can work from home. Email your resume to media at connectivetherapycollective.com and let's talk. All right, back to the show. Well, in some ways, Tara, that transitions really well into, I know we're going to spotlight kind of things at the end of our episode as we do, but that transitions well into the work you're doing. And 
I love hearing your backstory because that informs the why I imagine behind the work you're doing. But do you want to take a few minutes to share what's going on and what you're creating with our audience? No. Thank you for that. It's it, yeah, it's really exciting. I'll start with the Alana Faith Chen Foundation, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, as I said in the beginning, it's a 501c3 nonprofit that allows therapists to engage with folks that they might have tur- had to turn away because they couldn't afford therapy, especially in the LGBTQ plus community. So we have a network of amazing, queer affirming, queer educated therapists that we are in their back pocket. AFCF is in their back pocket for if they have somebody that is suffering from severe depression, suicidality, ideation, self-harm, we are there and, you know, we negotiate a rate with a therapist and then we commit to being there for six months to six years on this person's healing journey so that they never have to worry about you know, getting their help taken away. I believe very strongly that everybody needs one neutral person in their lives to survive and thrive. And the reason or how our grants work and why it's named Alana Faye Chen Foundation is that my cousin Alana died by suicide at the end of 2019. Alana and I were very different, but we were both lesbians in the closet. I didn't know that she was struggling from oppression within her community, within her. She was very into church. We were very different, but for her, she was into church and she had a community. And when she told a priest that she felt feelings for somebody else of the same sex, they put her in same sex attraction therapy, AKA conversion therapy. So, and Alana didn't have access to mental health care consistently because her parents couldn't afford it. She's underinsured. And queer affirming therapy never even was on anybody's radar. And I think it was a huge miss. So we formed the 501c3 about two weeks after Alana had passed in 2019. And I'm going to read something because I don't have it memorized and because I think it's really important. Okay. Yeah. Let's hear That's okay. Yeah. So Alana did a lot of writing. And so it's called Alana's Vision and it's written by her. It is my dream and will be my life's work to help empower those who are oppressed and marginalized to find freedom, to find healing, to find a voice. Adventure therapy, art therapy, and dialectical behavioral therapy were all paramount in my recovery and healing. And I hope to specialize in those areas when I become a counselor. It is my hope to somehow help make access to quality mental health services more accessible and more affordable. So I'm here to carry out Alana's mission. I was privileged to get the therapy I needed after suicide attempts and not belonging. And so this is how I dealt with losing my cousin. And we every day are helping, you know, dozens of people have access to queer affirming mental health care that won't be taken away because they're underinsured or uninsured. So that's my biggest passion. Um, mm, that's sure. so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I'm, I don't know about you, Melissa. I'm like, yeah, we're both like, mm-hmm, I'm not crying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That's really beautiful. I'm so sorry you lost your cousin. That's horrible. And to continue her legacy in such a beautiful way. It's really powerful. Yeah. I mean, she was amazing. She heard her parents, though, one day she had gotten back from a really, I mean, it was art therapy, adventure therapy. She really flourished and loved, loved going and it was impatient. And she got home and she has like three other siblings and she heard her parents in the kitchen saying like shit I don't know how we're gonna pay for therapy like what are we gonna do like how do we do this and she heard her parents talking and so the next couple of days she was like I'm good thank you so much for what you've given me and then you know a week later you were looking for her so so that's one thing that I'm doing that I'm really passionate about and um, so that's been since 2019 has been a lot of work. I am an accountant. I am a, I don't know. I wear every hat. In the, yeah. Like an accountant, the coordinator, the secretary, like 
the intern every single role. Like sometimes like when I'll leave for work or first like to go to school in the morning for like this six and a half hour day, like I'll come home and she's still in the same chair in the living room in the same spot. Like cold right, cup of coffee. Yeah. Right. Cold cup of coffee. And I'm like, okay, you have not eaten. Let go. Um, <laughs> but she figures out all of these amazing things like herself like wrote a pro like a product loss statement a profit loss statement and I was like I don't know what that even is like <laughs> and your site like setting up the whole website from the ground like in the hours that it's taken and meeting every single therapist like for this network that you're all you're doing that because through the Alana Faith Chen Foundation we were like, oh, we're re you're reaching out to all of these like queer affirming therapists, but they don't have any way to connect with each other. They don't have ways like a platform where like for potential clients or anyone for them to have a network and say, hey, like I am really struggling with like this aspect of someone like supporting them through their gender identity, like those things, there's nowhere for them to turn to. So it just, it amazes me to kind of see how it's like, most people will be like, oh, no, a problem we encounter. It's like, that sucks. And she's like, oh, no, a problem. I'll fix it myself. <laughs> sure. But we, you've done everything and more that you've expected to, which so. Well, it's all great. But our therapists are really, for AFCF, like I've, we have built a network of the most incredible, amazing therapists that are queer or in love with queers and just a beautiful community and everyone I talk to when I talked about the foundation or I talk about getting therapists together so that we have I'm not a therapist but I've navigated it for my entire almost my entire adult life so I feel really strongly about bringing people together and so I did see you know there's good old psychology today and it well, still to this day, I needed to find an ASD psychiatrist that there's very few that's that that I could find that were did adult autism. So not just, you know, that you'll see a lot about a child. So where did I, where did it leave me? Uh, my search psychology today. And I'm like, this is it. Like, this is all we got. Yes. And that little check mark that they have that says like LGBT, like affir affirmative, like that is something that they clicked on a box to like say, yeah, I could do that if we I love, want. We love all people. Yeah. Right? We don't like, know what that means. <laughs> yeah. There's no specific, there's no like training behind it. There's no like length of work or like clientele that proves that you've been successful. Like you could claim to be LGBTQ affirmative on psychology to today and also offer like conversion therapy services, which is terrifying. Like, there's not any real kind of checking of license, sure, and actual like, experience and what makes someone affirming in that way. Yeah. So when I went there, it just reaffirms what we're doing with Queer Psych. So Queer Psych is launching in end of June, mid-June. Really excited. We're halfway through the development. And so I decided that, you know, we meet a long list of therapists that say they're queer affirming and most of them are and educated and it's every time I decided that you know we want as many therapists as possible it will eventually be a directory which people pay for to be on we need to pay for site maintenance and all that so that will be coming later on but I've committed to talking to every single therapist that will be on queer psych personally Woo, that's quite the yes. task Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's something that is lacking when you're talking about this is that screening process. Cause you know, when Tara and I met, you were like, yeah, people will say there's these coin phrases and let's be real. It's for SEO, you know, when yeah. you're on a website and there's these catchphrases of queer affirming and, but what does that even mean? There's nothing in licensure. There's no board that's checking that if you say that you are queer affirming, that you actually have some guidelines to the education you've had outside of grad because grad work does not 
educate you within marginalized communities. There's no standard. So people can just put whatever they want on their website. And then that leaves an already vulnerable population even more vulnerable to potential. Oh, not it's not always overt conversion therapy, but definitely there are flavorings of conversion therapy with very different language in these groups around. And there are therapists practicing that. And so how do you find figure out who those people are and not suggest them? But they use phrases that can be scarily similar. And so if you're not if you don't know as a person looking for therapy, and they'll say things about like sexuality or gender. And so you think, oh, this is a person where I can go explore my gender or explore my sexuality. And it's actually a form of conversion therapy. Yeah. yeah. Even in addition to that, too, I mean, there's some clinicians who I think might be really great allies and are queer affirming in the sense that they are not going to shame or stigmatize the identity of the person coming in. But I have had clients who, even with those therapists, haven't felt comfortable talking about the details about their sex life and yeah. the position they were in when somebody had a flashback. And so it, it, time and time again, I've had clients feel so relieved of like, I can't believe I'm talking about this. I've never been able to say this in therapy. So that's not to shame people who are not queer, who are queer for make therapists. But I think that's where like the consultation before the therapy becomes really important to make sure this is somebody who's really going to be able to hold space for what you need. Yeah. And I think another important thing that I learned, so I've worked with all these therapists through AFCF and starting, we have this list of them through one by one. And it's amazing because like when I re reached out to you, Melissa, then you introduced me to Healy, which is amazing. And so that's the way it's been working. And so, yeah, I cannot wait to start doing online events and meet in person and just be there for each other. And one other thing that I want to say is that I personally only wanted to make queer psych open to queer affirming and LGBTQ educated and all of that. And I recently decided that I want to allow other therapists in some way to get involved that say that they are, they love everyone, right? Everybody needs to learn pronouns. There are just so many things that even, you know, straight cis folks are wanting to learn, but don't know where to go or what have you. So I do want to start doing some training on the site, which is going to be so exciting. We're doing these upcoming events just to introduce our trainers or our content contributors. So I'm super excited about all that. And I think that just finish up the thought on, on letting other therapists in, you know, they might not be in the directory right away or but they will have access to talk to peers and really you know start getting in there and getting educated and then maybe they can be added to the directory one day so we want to help them get there so if you're not able to be on the list there are ways to get there eventually and we want to support you in that I love it. And I'm so excited. Yeah, because I get to do some of those trainings. I get to be part of your training team. And it's so exciting. And I, I know I've talked to people. And one of the things as a trainer is there are queer people and there are trans people that don't want to have to do the labor to educate cis hetero folks. And for me, doing trainings that are accessible to all people, specifically people who aren't queer so that they can learn more and be more compassionate as a therapist, but also as a human, like there's opportunities and have a safe place where they can ask the questions where they then don't do unintentional harm to their mm -hmm. clients. Because regardless, even if someone isn't labeled as gender affirming or queer affirming therapist, they're going to have people in their office that come to them randomly that are queer. And so, yeah, it is important for everyone to be educated and what a great access point to be able to provide that. You know, one other thing that I think about too is I we're talking about my mom. I think about my mom a lot because I ha I was closeted. I was kind of said, I said I like girls and it was always like, okay, you're going through a phase or Tara's like being Tara was being different. And, you know, now after losing Alana, it was my mom's niece. So and everybody wishes that we could turn back time and make Alana feel more welcomed and really take her words to heart and all of that. And so my mom, she told me the other night she was out with a group of like five friends getting together 
And she said one of my, one of the people that were there was saying that pronouns are stupid and unnecessary. And my mom was enraged. Yet, I don't think she'd know how to answer the question or why. It's, she felt it in her heart that it was wrong with her, but she couldn't explain to her table why, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, how do we one day maybe educate regular everyday people? Be better humans, better, more inclusive. So that's also on my mind. And luckily, I handle the speech language pathology and language part of things. So that's a an extra and bonus. Another and issue for queer folks. Like language is dynamic and the meaning of things have changed. Like it has always changed. There's like all like that's something of the English language that is like a core characteristic of language that over time things can mean different things. They can mean plural and it can also mean someone who doesn't identify as a she or he type of like in that aspect of things. So I think it's nice to have like the science research part background and then be able to be like, hey, this is how you can actually like from the communication standpoint, like not show specific tendencies in your language. So you're also talking about how people sometimes have shame around the way their voice sounds, whether it's more masculine or feminine. I think speech is also, yeah. We do like transgender voice therapy is a huge part of my field, which is really nice. So there's like a lot of kind of science in behind what is masculine or feminine communication look like body language wise. Like how do you kind of manipulate those things in order to present yourself the way that you feel more, most comfortable. So that's something that I'm excited about as well. Oh, well, thank you. So, both of you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Amazing things on the, on the horizon nearby. So at this point, th- and thank you for sharing and please, oh, before we go to Queer Joy, can you share your, how would people contact you now that they hear this? How would they contact you about this information? Yeah. So you could reach out to me on Instagram. It's Tara L. Shop. You can always DM me there or email me at Tara at queersite.com. Yeah. Great. Well, we always like to wrap up. This has been a variety of joy and sadness and this amazing opportunities that you're presenting out of sadness and grief. And we like to wrap things up with talking about queer joy. So we'll have everyone share. Yeah. Yeah. Are you ready? I love it. We don't usually have guests. You know what? It popped into my head just now. Yes. Brilliant. Super authentic. It's the best kind yes. of queer joy. It's spontaneous <laughs> joy. So I was like, okay, so good news is we're getting married. We're engaged. We're married um, for 2024. And I just thought about this. We're getting married on a rooftop in the city. We're back in New York City after me being away for like 10 years. We have a very small posted stamp size apartment in the West Village in New York City. It's the gayest queerest area where we feel amazing. at home. I could pinch her butt or give her a hug in the street. And it's amazing. We have like the cubby hole around the corner, the last like OG lesbian bars around, like the graffiti on the streets is like kindness and like spray painted hearts. Uh, then we have like the pleasure chest down there that has like every amazing thing. I love, depending on what month it is, I like make up a little slogan for like for them in their store. It was like anal August, like 25% off, like all anal toy. And like I've, I'm very heavily invested in like those staples in our neighborhood. But I think like the joy of it is that like we both spent so much time thinking that a community like this or life like this didn't exist. Or we were like, she was sneaking out to like limelight when she was like 14 years old and like with the club kids in New York City. And like, we were both escaping to the mountains and trying to find that like inner peace and kind of wholeness in our community. But we have it here. We have it like with each other. We live in 
our house in the Berkshires is on Manville Street and our neighbors across the street are also lesbians that are our age and like an older woman and we are like the women of Manville Street. We have a group of people we watch drag race with in our tiny little town at one of like the nice restaurants. It's just like we we found our home and our niches, which is. And the other thing, just the last thing I'll end with is that I have hope today, I guess, is the queer joy. Nothing's off the table anymore. And I want to have kids one day and it's now possible again. And so that's like to have hope of things that didn't seem like it would be possible. I thought I'd end up, I was positive for a very long time that I would end my own life at some point. And now I can't even imagine about the things I would have missed. No. It's like, yeah, it's insane to think back and be, but we're so lucky that none of that worked out. But we had the opportunities because it's better than anything could have imagined. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Totally. Totally. Melissa, do you want to share a queer joy? Sure. Yeah. I'm still coming down for my queer joy. I had shared in an episode maybe a, a month or so ago that my high school drama teacher passed away in February, and I had the opportunity to go back to California over the weekend and attend a celebration of her life. And by far, it was like the just the best celebration of life I've been to. And part of that was the setting. It was held at my high school in the theater, and there was a big presentation where they actually pulled, she worked there for about 37, 38 years, and they pulled footage from every single show she directed <laughs> while she was there. And I ran into people I have not seen for 20 years who were, you know, the leads of the shows with me. It was better than any high school reunion would have, which those are just for your class. But in theater, you know, it's a family of like the seniors and the fresh, all the way down to the freshmen. And so to get to see all of these people from the most, one of the most pivotal periods of my life was just phenomenal. And for me, in addition to the people, I have a very big attachment to spaces and I got to go into the classroom where she taught us and I got to walk from the green room backstage out onto the stage and look at that whole wide audience. And that it just, uh, there's so much joy. That was, like I said, a really pivotal period of my life. And for me, that space is sacred. Yeah. Glad I got to go back. As a former drama kid, I can attest. <laughs> yeah. That's like the first like queer family kind of that oh, you, yeah. one ever gets is like the theater family. Totally. And like, I mean, like kind of as you were saying in your stories, I wasn't out in high school. I wasn't out until I was 31. No one was out at that point. Like we didn't know bisexuality was like a thing. So that was part of it. All of us comparing notes were like, you out yet? You're out. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I'm also a former theater person as well. So yes, all the, it was uh, throughout the years as more people come out, it's been its own adventure. Like, oh yeah, duh. Oh yeah. Duh. Oh, that's why you treated me that way. Oh, the really closeted Christians that would like pick on me or shame me. Oh, now that makes more sense. Yep. Well, my queer joy is a just a good old standard, like celebrating drag queens. I went to drag bingo last night nice. and, and got to just hang out. And what was really beautiful about it, though, is I'd been at there's this local bar named Escape. And it's not technically a lesbian bar, but it's owned by a couple who are lesbians. And it's often very queer. And they... It's been interesting watching them when they first started owning the bar about 12 years ago and took the bar over. They were like almost resistant to really call it a queer bar or like own that part of it. They wanted to be inclusive. And then I've just seen throughout the years, it really models what has happened in the nation and in Portland, Oregon, as this has become more and more mainstream that they have climbed, jumped onto it. And now, so 10 years ago, they were not doing drag shows. They weren't doing events. It was all like for everyone, still for everyone, but all these queer events now. And so I was there with a friend drinking, having a drink, and I didn't know the event was going on later. And she was ready. To, she wanted to leave because she had to go running. She's like this amazing runner. And I was like, what's the event going on at six? I heard someone say that. And this person comes up and is like, oh, you can come join our table. So 
before my friend even left, this group of queer people had already offered to have me sit down and hang with them. And so I just hung with, out with a bunch of strangers, did drag bingo. And then at one point I was outside, it's just this person I'd been kind of eyeing at the bar. And she's like, I'm really cold. Will you hug me? And so oh, what a line. I'm going to have the, okay. <laughs> Something beautiful about it though, was that that happened. And there was like a little bit of edge of flirtiness, but it didn't really go any further than that. And there's something really beautiful and queer about that, you know, because I feel like, I mean, if I was dating cis men and some cis dude asked me to hug him, A, I probably wouldn't do it. And B, there would have been probably a lot more trying to happen than a hug. And this was just an authentic hug and giving some a body more. It was just really sweet and awesome. So that's my queer joy. And otherwise, thanks both of you for your vulnerability, your lovely story, really sharing so much today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And for everyone listening, we hope you all have a queer and joyful week. Thanks for listening to Queer Relationships, Queer Joy, a podcast by the Connective Therapy Collective, hosted by Keely C. Helmick and Melissa DeSegurant, with audio edited by Leigh Supapo Bernito. I'm your producer, Cardinal Marking. Intro music is by Bad Snacks. This week's guests were Tara Sharp and Maddie Doust. Find Tara on Instagram at Tara L. Sharp or at Alana Faith Chen Foundation, or at Queer Psych. If this episode made you smile or think, tell us about it. If you hated it, tell us about that. Review us on iTunes or Spotify, or send us an email at media at connectivetherapycollective.com. For more queer joy, visit our Instagram at queer underscore relationships underscore queer underscore joy. Love ya. Bye.